Hello, everyone. Um, just that this is the last, uh, the 2023 Peace and World Summit uh, roundtable session. So um, I'm going to introduce the chair of this roundtable, uh, the retired U.S. Marine Corps Colonel William McLeod. Um, Norwich class of 1991, McLeod currently serves as the 56th Commandant of Cadet and Vice President of Student Affairs at Norwich University. He was commissioned into the Marine Corps in 1991 after graduating from Norwich. As a Marine, McLeod developed into a distinguished leader. He commanded 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, and the 1st Marine Regiment and the Crisis Response Marine Air Ground Task Force for the U.S. Central Command, as well as serving as an advisor team leader in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He served overseas in multiple operations, including Desert Thunder, Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and Inherent Resolve. In his final tours, he served as a director of the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, followed by serving as a Marine Corps liaison to the U.S. House of Representatives. So now I turn it over to Commandant William McLeod. Thank you. Thank you, Yangmo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final roundtable in uh, our fourth annual Peace and War Summit, where we're going to discuss, looking forward, Western strategy towards the Middle East. And uh, I'll point out it's Western strategy, not U.S. strategy. I'd like to begin um, Introducing, uh, I hope we have our fourth panelist joining us, and uh, Yang Mo, when he does come, if we could just have him come right down and uh, join the panel. But uh, I'll start with uh, Dan Shariak, is the director and principal of Shariak Consulting Incorporated in Ottawa. Uh, he's a senior fellow with the Center for International Governance and Innovation in Waterloo, the fellow in residence with the C.D. Howe Institute in Toronto, a distinguished fellow with the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada in Vancouver, and an associate with BKP Economic Advisors in Munich. So covers the entire continent and uh, across the pond. He has had a 31-year career with Canada's civil service. He retired as the deputy chief economist at the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. And he's written extensively on international trade and finance, innovation and industrial policy, economic development, with a particular focus on the digital transformation and the economic and technological roots of great power conflict. So he brings a, a great deal. Um, Dr. Ali Disboni yeah, is a uh, welcome. Associate Professor and Chair of uh, Military and Strategic Studies Program at the Royal Military College of Canada. He's a, an Associate Fellow at Queen's University. His current research includes the formation of the Wahhabi State in Saudi Arabia, the genesis of ballistic missiles in the Middle East, and right-wing radicalization in selected NATO armed forces. Um, he's published numerous collaborations, uh, one of which was the Future Trends of Canadian Military Operations in the Middle East and the Terrorist Resourcing Model as Applied to Canada. Uh, and his latest collaboration is Developing Strategic Lieutenants in the Canadian Army. He's a media commentator on Middle East and Iranian politics, and he received his PhD from the University of Montreal and speaks four languages, English, French, Persian, and Arabic. Dr. Jeremy Pressman, right next to me here, uh, studies international relations, protests, the Arab-Israeli conflict, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. He co-founded and co-directs the Crowd Counting Consortium, uh, an event counting project that's tallied and made publicly available data on all manner of protests in the United States since 2017. He received his PhD in political science from MIT and previously worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's held fellowships at Harvard, at Brandeis, at the University of Sydney, and the Yukon Humanities Institute, as well as the Nobel Norwegian Nobel Institute, where he was a Fulbright Fellow. His most recent book is The Sword is Not Enough, Arabs, Israelis, and the Limits of Military Force, and he's written several other books that uh, will come to play during our discussion. And at the end, we have our own Dr. Nick Roberts, 
uh, an historian of the modern Middle East and Islamic world. Uh, as many of you know, he's an assistant professor of history here at Norwich. And for this academic year, he's the inaugural W. Nathaniel Howell postdoctoral fellow in Arabian Peninsula and Gulf Studies at the University of Virginia. He earned his doctorate from Notre Dame, and he earned his Master's of Arts in History from Georgetown. And his current book project, A Sea of Wealth, Saeed Saeed bin Sultan, His Omani Empire, and the Making of an Oceanic Marketplace, draws on research from more than a dozen archives across four continents. So those are our panelists. Now, before we get into the questions I have for them, I wanted to give a short preamble. Um, when I was a student here in the late 1980s, uh, the Cold War with the Soviet Union and the rise of Japan as a challenge to our economic power were two overarching themes that we grappled with as students. It permeated uh, the national security framework and all students thought about it, not just those that were getting commissioned. The situation on the Korean Peninsula was not far out of our students' minds. Uh, many of us concerned and uh, studying how we might apply our trade to that conflict should it come out. European Command and Pacific Command uh, were the dominant voices in the Department of Defense. And despite a brief jump in importance during the first Gulf War, Middle Eastern concerns played often a distant third to Europe and Asia in terms of strategy formation in the United States and the West in general. After the attacks of 2001, the Middle East and the global war on terror became the dominant considerations in national security and foreign policy decision making for the next two plus decades. My first year back here at Norwich, uh, past becomes prologue. And I find our focus again, focus back not on the Soviet Union, but on Russia. Um, and I find the other half of our mind focused towards Asia, not this time uh, with Japan as an ascending global power, but now it's China replacing Japan as our economic adversary, but now combined as a military adversary as well. Korea again runs third. The regions of the world covered by UCOM and now Indo-PACOM again dominate our discussions about national security exactly the way they did 35 years ago when I was a student here. And yet, there remain substantial problems in the Middle East. We've touched on Iran and their nuclear ambitions, Israel-Palestine, the remnants of ISIS and its offshoots throughout the region, Russian and Chinese activities in the region, and of course, we still have the flow of oil that affects global markets. With all of those observations in mind, I'd like to pose the first question to the panel. Um, can you describe our historical pre-Gulf War strategic approach to the Middle East and give us some idea of some approaches that the West got right during that era and what we got wrong during that era? And uh, I know, Dr. Roberts, you had uh, some ideas uh, immediately that we were discussing before the panel. If you could kick us off. I'd like to keep this to about five minutes. Right. So uh, very quickly, one of the things that I think the United States got right in the Middle East, actually, I would say, has nothing at all to do with the Middle East or anywhere else in the world. And that is that the United States did a much better job decades ago of keeping its own house in order. Uh, that the past, let's say, 20 years, you know, since 9-11, I'll just say some examples from my own personal life. Since I graduated college, the cost of living, average cost of living in the United States has increased 60%. My generation is, uh, owns, has 3% of wealth in the United States. It's the lowest percentage any generation has ever had in U.S. history. And so here I'm drawing on, for students in the room, Dr. Richard Haas, the outgoing president of the Council on Foreign Relations, has a great book where he says, nation building begins at home. Uh, and so I would submit that one of the things that the US did right in the world, not just the Middle East, is take care of itself. The second thing I would say it did right was it practiced restraint. Uh, so for example, uh, the 1954 invasion of Egypt for control of the Suez Canal by Israel, France, and Great Britain, President Eisenhower said, not on my watch. He stopped it immediately. 
And in fact, the power of that was not just stopping a conflict, but that actually made the United States look incredibly powerful on the world stage. So restraint itself can be a tremendously powerful show of force. Uh, so those are two, two thoughts I would provide for the first question. I'll have a go as well. Um, the United States is a big player in the world, and it doesn't always pay attention to the impact that its, its own decisions for its own uh, purposes have on the rest of the world. You know the phrase uh, that uh, oil is uh, black gold. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, it literally was because the price of oil in terms of gold flatlined. You knew exactly what the value of, of oil was in terms of gold. When President Nixon took um, the dollar off gold, the price of oil in terms of gold gyrated enormously. It was an enormous amount of uncertainty uh, injected into the uh, world economy, and no economy was more subject to the uncertainty and to the implications of wild gyrations in the value of, of its principal commodity than the Middle East, and the rest is history. They, in terms of um, what U.S. got wrong, right uh, before uh, Gulf War in 1991, if I got the question right. I think a couple points, uh, containment, George Cannon doctrine against Soviet Union, I think generally it was positive. Uh, realism, most of the time, depending, gives good insights into how contain adversaries and foes. Uh, mutual containment, Iran, Iraq war, uh, from US perspective, that was kind of weakening. The two strongest adversary of the State of Israel, but also states who are not in line with US interests in the region. So that was uh, losing Iranian uh, monarchy as an ally was on the downside of the picture of things before, like during Cold War. I'm gonna stop there. Yeah. Just two quick points. One is, since we're talking Western strategy, maybe to connect to uh, Dr. Roberts' point and bring in Britain, which was a country that had a long run as a, as a global empire, but eventually, as happens, its material capabilities could no longer keep up with its responsibilities. And so we see first, as Dr. Roberts mentioned, the Suez War and, and the British uh, humiliation there. And then, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 1960s, uh, the, the end of the, the, the significant British role in the Persian Gulf. So a reminder of material capabilities and what your economic and political base at home is like is ultimately gonna uh, affect your ability to project power and to be involved abroad. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Now, to take it to the next step, um, we all saw Western strategy change remarkably after the attacks of 2001 and evolve during the global war on terror. Um, what overarching lessons do you think we should have learned that must remain in the minds of Western strategists today as they analyze our approach towards the Middle East, keeping in mind uh, the ascendancy of Russia and China back to the place that they used to occupy. Dan, please. I have one snippet to add here. Um, insofar as American interventions in the Middle East were uh, uh, qualified as an investment in America's security, we fight them over there so we don't fight them over here, then the principle of investment applies and you have to take into account the uncertainty. As the uncertainty effect rises, the, the hurdle rate for that investment soars. And I don't think that the hurdle rate for the uh, investments in, what looked at this way in terms of going into Iraq or elsewhere, uh, were taken into account. And what, so you have to be extraordinarily certain of the, of the outcome of the event. And war, of course, is the most uncertain event possible, which guides you to restraint. Well, I'm going to say a couple of words. I'm not super optimistic about Washington, D.C. Uh, leadership. However, I'm very optimistic about the American forces generation rising from Afghanistan and post-Iraq, uh, publishing books, uh, being part of the national debate and how to make policies, how to think of the world, and most important in my view, because it impacts the world, 
how the United States defines its own national interest. So I am confident in the potential of that generation of military and uh, uh, military policy leadership to contribute to that. I'll add something, uh, which is yesterday I made a misstatement, which is so I see four students that we reached to another professor and I took to DC. And I said, we went to all of these government agencies and institutions and they all said, no one here in DC has time to read a lot, right? I said, we need it on one page. I was wrong. There was one place we went in DC where they said the opposite of that. And that was in the Pentagon. We were meeting with the Army G2, head of Army Intelligence. She said to the students, you guys need to read books. And she said, not just read books, you need to read books with footnotes. And the historian in me was just leaping with joy. She said, you need to read the footnotes more carefully than the book. And so one of the things I think that we've learned um, from this 20 years of the global war on terror is just how deeply we have to study and think and red team ourselves uh, to think about all the different possibilities, things that could go wrong, things that could go right, beginning with the labels we use, like the idea of a war on terror. Uh, terrorism, there's a great book out there by a guy named Randall Law, History of Terrorism. He says, terrorism is as old as humankind and as new as this morning's news. You're never going to get rid of terrorism. Uh, and so, you know, some deep, careful study, deep, careful thought, you know, about how we were to respond to 9-11, I think, would have, would have done the country a lot of good. I think just to, to build on that point, there's a risk when you define something in terms of an amorphous concept instead of uh, many other conflicts which are defined in terms of a specific enemy. Um, and so I, I, I would second that, and also the way it's kind of had an open-ended uh, function in time. And we, if you think about September 11, 2001, uh, 21 and a half years ago, and uh, if, I'm, if I'm doing my math right, and, and here we are with Congress debating whether to finally uh, close the, the authorization for the use of force. So I, 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 would, I would build on that point first. The, the second thing I would say is about uh, nationalism. I think sometimes we forget how powerful nationalism is, how powerful people's devotion to their own society is. And it's kind of ironic to me that we forget that because we each feel quite passionate about our own society, and particularly at a, at a school that trains many military leaders, people who've made a decision to help defend and advance the national interests of their country. We, we often, and I don't just say this here, we often forget the extent to which people in every country feel that way about their territory, about their culture, about their society, about their agency. And so I think, sadly, the last 20 years have been a reminder of that, that, that we need to be quite, uh, quite cognizant of. Well, now then, with that as a preamble, to the heart of the panel, um, acknowledging the emphasis of national security making on Europe, and Asia Pacific region at this time, and taking into account the lessons you believe we should have learned from our deep past and our recent past, I'm gonna call you out and ask what should Western Middle Eastern strategy look like in the future? And if you could run it through the lenses of your various backgrounds where we touch on um, not just military posture, but what economic policies um, what sort of partnerships should we be developing? What should be our diplomatic priorities? And what sort of desired outcomes would we like to see in the information realm that will maybe mark our future in the Middle East as a, a little bit more successful than what we have exhibited in the past? And we've got 20 minutes to chew over this topic, so I'd love to see where it goes. Should we just go down the line? Yeah, let's start, start with right. you, Nick. Um, I'll start with a few things. So um, one is, you know, okay, let's bring some history into the conversation, which is that I think that one thing we're seeing is that the Middle East is now, as it always has been, enmeshed in global, whatever global is. So China, Russia, Africa, this is all a very interconnected part of the world. And the United, neither the United States nor any other country is ever going to be able to compartmentalize it away from the rest of the world. Um, that being said, I would say that one of the things that I think the United States should do is instead of 
very often our reflex is let's identify our weaknesses and, and think about we can improve. But the United States has some tremendous strengths that no other country can imitate. And that is kind of going off my last question is this idea of culture, of soft power. Uh, I remember deca uh, a decade ago, a long time ago, I was, I was in Tunisia living in North, North Africa. I was driving uh, along the border with Libya. And it was quiet, you know, just olive trees and, and you know, stuff like that. And all of a sudden, I, th I, th I thought I was going crazy because I, I thought I heard American pop music. And I, th I checked the radio. I, no, the car radio wasn't on. I'm in the middle of nowhere along the Libyan border. And as I get closer to this building, I said, oh, that, that's Beyonce. <laughs> the fact that I was hearing Beyonce playing in the middle of the desert of the border with Libya, that's American power. And I would say not, that's not a bad thing. I mean, come on, Beyonce is amazing. Uh, but this brings up broader points. You know, I often say to my students, hey, would it, did any of you ever think, I'm going to go get my undergraduate degree in Shanghai? Everyone wants to come to the United States for, for an education and for culture. Uh, and so I think that kind of leaning into those strengths and not necessarily looking at everything in the world through a military lens uh, or just through an assumption of this is a problem that needs to be uh, controlled you know, by the military. Because first of all, that's bad for the military uh, to begin with, but um, those are some thoughts maybe to just get us started. But also, speaking even broader, what we're seeing in the Middle East and the rest of the world is really a, I wouldn't say it's a decline of US power because we don't even need to speak of the United States as a constant reference for everything. But what we are seeing is kind of a return to a, a more natural, you could say organic homeostasis on the world stage. So it is incorrect to talk about the rise of China or the rise of India or the rise of Iran. We're seeing the re-rise of Iran and China and India. Uh, these countries, these societies have always been tremendously powerful and flourishing. Um, and I think what we're living through is an acknowledgement in the United States and, and certain parts of Europe uh, that the world is kind of returning to this, to this more organic homeostasis. So if I can follow up, uh, what the Middle East needs most is uh, stability uh, and development and a reduction of uncertainty. Uncertainty is a killer for economic development. Um, and the United States policy has not been oriented towards stability in the Middle East. Uh, it has been a wrecking ball by going in, in, in militarily into Afghanistan and then into um, uh, Iraq. And the sanctions which are imposed on Iran also represent a form of economic warfare. So the question is, how do you then build down that instability and reduce uncertainty? And here you are talking language which is very similar to China's. China's values are stability uh, and the iron rice bowl. It is providing economic certainty, moderate prosperity, if you will, uh, to their population. So there is a point where if if we go into uh, continue with our Middle East policy is now a contest for hegemony uh, between China and the United States, that ex exacerbates the uncertainty about what that outcome will be. You heard from Ambassador Alutani that they don't want to choose because that forcing that choice creates an uncertainty as to which way they will go and, and what that will imply for their societies and their economies. So I think we need to, to find a language on which we can agree with China and which is, emphasizes that which is most important for the Middle East. So that's where I would put uh, the, uh, the emphasis on. In relation to the military posture, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was also destabilizing. It was done rapidly, and as we heard yesterday from one of the students, uh, it, it was now well prepared in terms of uh, handling the human side of things. Um, I would not recommend that the United States, even if it wants to withdraw and build down its forces uh, in order to uh, uh, refocus its force uh, uh, focus on, on the Far East, that it should do so on an extraordinarily stable, predictable, well-signaled manner uh, and just emphasize 
the stability for the region and certainty for uh, its, um, its populations. I'll leave it to that. Yes. Um, a few points here. Um, I'm not sure to what extent they have internal consistency, but I do my best to be in coherence with other input here. Um, a student presentation yesterday about some international issues cause for optimism again. Um, they presented about North Korean stuff, Iranian uh, proliferation, and uh, they brought a new critical perspective. I liked it very much. So that's being said, I'm a bit worried about an American side, the polarization in the society and politics. How they can America first and America as a, however you want to brand it, peacemaker, deal breaker, leader of the free world. This tension in the US foreign policy needs somehow to find a middle ground or compromise. Otherwise, one president, you correct me if I'm wrong, gets into some international commitment and the other sees that maybe US wants to rethink that or revise that, right? So that's a second point. Um, overextension and um, resources. You heard about Paul Kennedy theory of the fall, rise and fall of empires. That applies to China. Actually, people are saying that China is getting involved in Middle East is a good thing because they are getting back to reality now. They cannot be on the margin. They are in the game. So coming back to Washington, this overextension and resource is a consideration that the US um, Nick talked about the number of the military bases in the world. It's a lot, and the military commitment. So that's something to think about. Um, American dream, there is some, it's still there, but there is a debate how that dream gonna go forward. Uh, I think Americans, despite polarization, there is a consensus, I may be wrong, there is a consensus across the nation that nation building and state building we should go beyond it using um, military forces um, and mission to export liberal democracy, uh, good intention, but doesn't give the expected result. So I don't see the future generation of security mission would be for nation building. They're rather for stabilization, assistance, stuff like that. Um, um, so that would be, I'm gonna finish on this one before going to Jeremy, is um, the focus on counterterrorism approach toward Middle East. Maybe that should go, we, we gotta go beyond that counterterrorism US policy to Middle East, like one hammer and all problems look like a nail. And, um, uh, go and uh, go beyond the perspective of what, what um, Ben said in terms of uh, development. Other stuff in Middle East that the nation need, but that gets us back to the question of polarization. Uh, Chinese, Russians, and others, they are a bit also asking themselves, what does really Washington think? For, I'm gonna finish on this, Jeremy, I yeah, promise. Please. Saudi Arabia, we know why Iranian got close to Saudi Arabia previous round table, somehow. But we, are, we don't know why Saudi Arabia kind of got close to Iran. We know Iranian reason, but the other way around, we're not sure. Does Saudi Arabia think or ask themselves questions about what US intentions or uh, long-term, short-term, middle-term, medium-term plan is in the region. So I, again, I get back to polarization. Uh, somehow impacts okay. the views and perceptions of the partners in the NATO and beyond about what US direction is despite the noble intention. Yeah, go ahead. So one, one general thought, and then maybe some more specific thoughts. I, I tend to think we're in the midst of a global struggle right now, and it's, an, it's a kind of age-old struggle. It's the struggle between uh, popular social movements and popular mobilizations of people trying to take control of their political destiny uh, in the face of repressive governments that want to maintain power 
and, and want to uh, weaken and stop those movements. Um, and we see that in Iran right now. We've seen that recently in a diverse array of countries, Belarus, uh, Sudan, other, other, many other countries around the world. So it's nothing, there's nothing new about that in, in some sense. But we're in a different technological age. And I think some of the early thinking about some of the new communication technology, social media and, and otherwise, was that that would work to the great advantage of the, of the popular mobilization. But I think what, what we've learned in recent years, and why is it uh, for those scholars who are studying the success and failure of social movements, are they observing uh, a, a kind of decrease in the success of social movements uh, when they're trying to overturn their, their repressive government? Maybe it's because those governments have started to master those tools and understand how they can actually use those tools against the popular mobilization, against the protest movements. And so uh, while I think in a moment like that, there's going to be a temptation for a powerful government like the United States to want to intercede. Mm -hmm. I don't have a per perfect answer on this, but I think it's something the United States should be very cautious about. Again, whether we're thinking about a country like Belarus, right, right very close to a major US adversary and allied with a major US adversary, Russia, whether we're talking about Iran, obviously a decades-long hostile relationship between the two, the, the ability, of the, the temptation of a superpower is to want to jump in, to want to influence events, and, and, and that's got to be something that's very carefully calculated because oftentimes I think the risk is that we're going to uh, taint the, the, the protesters or taint the popular mobilization by trying to, to make a connection. And then just a few um, um, specific points sort of uh, less related to that. For the United States in terms of thinking about the Middle East, I suppose one of the biggest questions is to think about the reliance on authoritarian governments. And, and we've talked about the previous panel talked a lot, a lot about authoritarianism. And, and there's, again, there's nothing unique to this about, about the Middle East or even this current particular period. As, as those of us who are older in the room know, the, the, the question of what kind of governments the United States should ally with was very central to the Cold War as well all around the world. And, and important US allies that helped the United States win that Cold War, some of them were not democratic countries. And that was a crucial part of the fight. But I think what we also see in the Middle East, if not other places, is sometimes the cost that the United States pays by allying itself with uh, a, a, seg a segment of society, a segment of the elite, at the expense of maybe the opinions of a wider swath of the, of the population. And you know, I, there's no easy answer to this. I don't have the answer. But I think about two, two different kinds of relationships. Sometimes the United States has been consistent relatively consistent with an authoritarian country like Saudi Arabia. And that's difficult when you have differences with Saudi Arabia. Uh, when Saudi Arabia, when the leadership kills a Washington Post columnist, and then you're trying to grapple with that, but you've taken a position of consistency. That's very difficult. At the same time, we could look at a country like Iraq and the US-Iraqi relationship, where we've talked about yesterday about some of the back and forth, right? The United States working closely, relatively closely with Iraq in the early 1980s to very different situation, go for 1990 sanctions into the, into the 2003 invasion. So it's not an easy question, but I, I think we really need to be cognizant about, about the costs of, of setting ourselves against where the majority of the population thinks. And maybe Iran is a cautionary tale on that. I, I defer to some of my colleagues who know more about uh, Iran, but thinking about you know, the US proximity to the Shah and then the total uh, flip to, to since 1979 and 1980 uh, in terms of US-Iranian relations. Um, the second sort of point I wanted to make just on the side here is about um, the particular, and, and I'll be briefer on this, is about the particular mix of instruments that the United States uses in its foreign policy to, to caution ourselves uh, about even with a country like Iran, where there's much hostility and much reason for that hostility and much uh, tension to remind ourselves in the US and maybe in other, other Western countries that, that uh, the United States government uh, retains the full array of, um, of um, statecraft, the full array of, of instruments across the spectrum. And we often say that to remind about the military dimension. I actually mean the opposite here, to, to remind ourselves that um, as much as economic sanctions are one tool, economic incentives are another tool that states hold. As much as the use of military force or the threat of military force is one technique that states have, that the United States or other states also have the possibility of diplomacy and negotiation. And so the first, I want to say two final things about this, a lot of the attention that's been on this uh, Chinese role in mediating the Iranian, Saudi, whatever it is, and we'll, we'll find out. Maybe it's nothing, maybe it's something. But um, so, so one point is, 
you have to have considered that you could use negotiations and mediation to have played a role in that. And, and to the extent that sometimes the United States maybe doesn't put enough emphasis on the possibility of mediation and diplomacy, um, you're going to miss that opportunity. And then the last point I wanted to say, kind of going in a different direction, is we see, I, I don't have to tell you that uh, the United States right now is quite a partisan country. We talk about polarization, radicalization, fragmentation of the United States, questions about U.S. democracy. I don't think we can understand January 6th uh, without understanding the, the, the tenuous nature of, of American democracy right now. So I think that, that induces a little humility, but specifically on this question of some, uh, to use the, the example of China mediating between Iran and Saudi Arabia, I know a lot of people said, oh, this shows that China's ascendant and this, you know, this is, where was the United States and stuff? But I was, I, I was just as a kind of thought experiment, I was trying to imagine um, um, uh, one of the media channels that might be more cynical or hostile towards the Biden administration had they learned that the United States was engaged in secret negotiations with Iran, right? How would that have played in Washington, D.C. if it spilled out that the Biden administration was facilitating secret negotiations uh, with the Iranians? Uh, I don't know for sure, but I think there would have been some partisan tension. I'm not trying to point fingers on this issue at one particular side. What I'm trying to suggest is that part of the history that you steered us towards was a history where there wasn't unanimity in the United States on every step of the way that we've talked about, but there was often a much stronger bipartisan consensus, certainly about confronting the Soviet Union, and that the loss of that of that consensus, whether it's on the question of Israel-Palestine, whether it's on the question of Iran, uh, whatever the question is, the loss of that consensus, I think, is going to come at a price for presidents of either party who are trying to advance uh, the U.S. national interest. Um, several of you talked about stability as being one of the, the goals. And I'm, I'm often reminded, when I was young, my family would take these cross-country trips, and it's uh, Several children in the back seat, mom and dad were up front, and we would leave Minnesota, and the eruptions from the back seat, parents would uh, be involved in who did what to whom. There was a sense of fairness about deciding what happened. And by the time we hit the North Dakota border, no one was interested in fairness anywhere. What they wanted was quiet. And it was a different sort of uh, approach to achieving stability. One was to get to the root of problems and try to settle it, and eventually patience wore out, and they just demanded quiet. Um, when you all approached stability, can you give us any insights as to how people can maintain that first approach for a little bit longer? Because it, it tends to involve a lot more attention. It tends to involve a lot more uh, real discernment of what is the nature of the disagreement to begin with. So there are different types of stability that can be achieved. Um, some are short-term, some are long-term. But each of you mentioned stability at least one point. Is, uh, is there anything you can bring up that could help the strategist of the future achieve a stability that has some roots that allow it, it to stay uh, more stable for longer because it addressed the right things. I'll jump in here with, with uh, uh, an economic theory. It's called the theory of second best. Um, you're probably not familiar with this, but basically what it says is if, if in an economic uh, framework, uh, all uh, sort of parameters are set to optimum, okay, uh, and then you take one and, and remove it from the optimal position, now you're at a suboptimal uh, outcome, the question is, does retaining the other ones at optimum, a guarantee, is, is that the best outcome possible? And the answer that the theory of second best tells us is that keeping the other uh, uh, parameters at optimum is not necessarily the best outcome then. So once you're in a suboptimal world, theory stops guiding you as to which direction to go. You really have to fly by the seat of your pants in terms of finding out what next step is actually going to be better. Is it towards the optimum, or is it towards something that you would normally not consider? So when we're looking at the Middle East, we're in uh, you know, just a whole lot of suboptimal positions. So the way forward has to be something which is uh, uh, pragmatic and experimental and, and gradual and see what works. And, and if you can nudge the system towards a more stable, quieter outcome, then you're moving in the right direction. So pragmatic experimentalism 
on the way forward, I do think would be a, a thought to, to, as a principle in terms of, excuse me, in terms of, of, of enhancing stability. And your readout should not be whether American interests are directly served, but whether, in fact, the, the situation in the Middle East is becoming calmer. Related to that is, it's interesting you bring that up because I've often said I, I wish I had studied more psychology. And I wonder why it is in the minds of policymakers and perhaps all of us in that when we see one thing happen in the world, we automatically think that it's coming at our expense. So China negotiates this deal with Iran and Saudi Arabia. The, all of the questions were, wow, does this represent you know, the decline of American power? Is this a bad thing for us? And I always wonder why. I mean, in fact, I, see, I, I can't see many reasons why it's not a good thing that, that China negotiated this deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I hope it holds true. I hope it works. Um, because as, as Dan was saying, you know, this stability is a, is a good thing. And people, countries, states talking to each other is a good thing. Um, one of the things, if, you know, if we're talking about how can the United States, in the Indian Ocean region, in the Middle East, uh, if the question is, you know, how can we extend uh, United States influence and so forth, one of the things that I would like to see a return to is, is a greater uh, mindset toward the idea of soft power, uh, and especially education. You know, when, when other people come to the United States and spend four years to get an undergraduate degree and something, that, that you know, it's like an oil spot on a, on a piece of paper. I mean, it does spread certain values, and not even American values, but, you know, greater tendencies toward just human beings understanding each other and, and so on and so forth. Um, economically in the region, I think one of the things that the uh, ambassador uh, was talking about yesterday, and, and this was a distinctly Emirati approach to the world, is just a very ideal, he kept talking about, you know, let's not have ideology, let's not have ideology. Um, of just a very um, kind of down to the core of the issue, you know, approach to the world. Um, and I think maybe the world might be going back toward that, you know, let's not approach the world necessarily through some sort of grand ideology, but rather just more basic uh, goals. So at this time, we've got a chance for folks to uh, line up and ask the panel what, uh, what the burning questions you have. I see we've got several students out there, so I hope you got some questions because the Middle East is in your future. and. Uh, you will, you will be grappling with opportunities and challenges throughout your young adult time. Drukshan, are you ready? Always. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, uh, to all the panelists for being here and for sharing their insights. Um, from the previous panel, something that I want to add um, to all the words that or terminologies that they wanted to add about Middle East um, is one woman, very important one. Uh, I mean, goodness, we we dragged America um, behind us because we were being oppressed. So let's not forget that. Obviously, it's meta it's a metaphor, but women were the rhetoric behind why. America went to uh, uh, Afghanistan, one of the other uh, country I come from. But at the same time, uh, we mentioned family in the Middle East. So women are the drive, the number one drive to um, function the, like in the family. And also they are the core and the fundamental element of how the society works, even though they don't have much representation. But it doesn't necessarily mean we can undermine their role, especially for you, sir. I'm going to call you out here, uh, uh, Dr. Ali here. I'm sure your mother plays a big role for you to sit here in this chair. Um, so for you, you should be the first one to mention it. Um, and then for Professor Roberts mentioning the soft power here about the role of the United States, I believe that's an amazing and an excellent point. But something about the symposium in the past two days, we see that um, the question is about the impossible mission of like peace in the Middle East. But do we see the names that are mentioned 
United States, China, Japan, all these other elements. Uh, if we are looking at it at this as a novel, do we see the Middle East as a protagonist here, or all these other countries as the protagonists? So if you could have the insight about that, and something specifically to Colonel McCullough here, how do you see this symposium being uh, an element for Norwich community to be able to support the students that come from that region in this community? It's to not make this uh, symposium so detached from the members that have come to this place, but rather bring it in an existential way to say each one of us how we can play our role and what could be the take as the leader of the community for you. I know it was a lot, so I appreciate your responses and ahead of time. Thank you. Quickly on this, um, uh, Valentine was supposed to be here. She had some uh, emergency, couldn't make it. So we shuffled around the panel. So she would be really the best person if you could connect them to answer. And your question also brings in the critical th theories and alternatives and constructivism in the peace building. And that's a big deal now in international debate, uh, schools, and also media. Uh, women, minorities, uh, you're right. Our today's panel, uh, well, made it best because we didn't have much time. Very state-focused, non-state actors a bit, but we didn't go, well, again, it was conceived originally that Dr. Muqaddam will be here, but that didn't happen. So, um, however, Nick, brought out a lot of critical voices in terms of defense, investment, and the impact on uh, uh, the US economy. How, um, how we created a monster that we cannot control. Um, Frankenstein scenario. Anyway, so we had a lot of critical voices. But where you want to go, it was conceived in the program to be covered, but for some reason beyond our control, didn't have. Just very, very quickly so we can get as many questions as possible. Um, I tried to do justice to your question um, in some way yesterday in my presentation in that, you know, we all, we do need to acknowledge that we are here in the United States, um, North Americans here on this panel, debating what peace looks like in the Middle East. Uh, this is not the Middle East, Middle Eastern people debating for themselves what peace looks like in their countries. And that is empire. Uh, and perhaps a cautionary tale. You know, again, I had mentioned people don't like having historians in the room because a historian will say, name me an empire that has not fallen apart. And Drukshan, we'll, we'll talk more later as we always do, but uh, any time we can get distinguished thought leaders in front of students to debate about any topic, we are fulfilling the requirement that I believe we have uh, to challenge people's thoughts, get them introduced to ideas they may not have heard before, uh, and to go back to their barracks room or their, their uh, residence hall and fall asleep thinking about the new idea that they heard, then we are being the university that we proclaim that we are. So you and I will have many discussions as will uh, all of the students here. On this side, we had someone patiently waiting. Right. Um, I had a quick question about the new ideas and the new government types of, there's constant debate between nationalism and globalism, and even the new thoughts of neo-medievalism, and the rise of private armies in countries such as Turkey, and how these will affect the Middle East and for a positive or Negatively. Um, I can say a word. Yeah, well, well, let's, uh, let's hit this one. Do you want to say a word there? Okay. I mean, I think in the, in the tension between, um, between globalism and nationalism, I mean, you're highlighting an important facet of the last 40 years. I mean, you're, you're building on some of the things that Dan has said over the last two days about the changes in the international economy and how that has connected uh, states and peoples in different ways, um, but the extent to which it's in, often in tension with nationalism. And it's, it, it, it can very much um, create some of the, the instability that, um, that some of the foremost proponents of globalization purport that they're, 
that they're trying to avoid. So I would say that in, in terms of, of globalism and nationalism, that's one of the big tensions of the last few decades, and it's a, it's a continuing tension. You briefly mentioned um, the word neoliberalism, right? Which new, new, neo medievalism as well. Oh, so neo medievalism. Ne neoliberalism. Neoliberalism. Yeah. yeah. Neo medievalism. Oh, 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 oh. Neo medievalism. Okay. Sorry. So I'll stop. I thought you said something. Neo medievalism. Wow. Um, I, I guess I can sort of add a little bit to what Jeremy said there. Um, in terms of like, if if you think about the evolution of the economy. The industrial economy um, at one point was uh, had increasing returns, so that meant that there were super normal profits and there was a lot of rivalry to capture those industries. And that was the era of the early phase of industrialization. And you saw empire building. Countries built empires in order to have captive markets and to have captive so uh, resources. Colonialism and, and, and the, the, uh, the, the, the era of, um, uh, 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 of the, the, the scramble for Africa, for example, came out of the early industrial era, the economics of it in one way, if you, if you look at history through an economic lens. When you get to the post-war period, um, that changed. By that time, the global economy was sufficiently large that the economies of scale were exhausted. These, when I was going to university in the 70s, the stylized fact that we uh, assumed was that there were costs and returns to scale and a cost and labor share of income. Because they're called the Caldor facts. Uh, in, um, in, in the economic literature, and these, indi these are in, uh, uh, indicated that the world was competitive. Now, what, how did the world evolve under a competitive framework? It evolved by spreading industrial activity throughout the world. So we wound up with a made-in-the-world e economy. Um, the, the book, The Global Factory, was uh, written in 1985. Okay, 10 years before the World Trade Organization was formed. That world integrated East Asia and other countries into it, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't neoliberal in the sense of the, the, that we think of it as, as, a, as, a, as a bad thing, which is concentrating income at the top percentiles. It was very friendly to development, and it was not at odds with nationalism in any way. Uh, the, that was one of the best periods, in fact, for internationalism. And what changed was when you had, again, technological changes that introduced new increasing returns industries and protection into the system through uh, intellectual property, which then concentrated income. You saw the rise, the profit share of income start to rise around 1980, the labor share start to fall, and then all of that tension is transmitted into national political frameworks. And you, and you wind up with populism emerging, being naturally stoked by the change in, in income distribution at the national level. At that point, you have the tension between globalization and, um, and nationalism, if you will. But it's not because of the industrial economy. It's because of this intellectual property, this knowledge-based economy, and then later the data economy. So what you really what we have to do in terms of understanding the impact of, uh, the, the, the global, of globalization on our economies is to understand which segment of the, uh, of the economy, if you will, is generating that tension that, that be between global and, and national and address that with, with uh, policies that, that dampen down the tensions internally. What we have need is an income redistribution uh, 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 system in the West because as someone said, Nicholas said, his generation has the lowest share of income of 3% wealth. of wealth. That's not a tenable situation going forward. We simply did not manage the distribution of wealth implications of technological change. So it's not a nationalism versus globalization. It's an understanding of your actual economics of, um, of production. I'll leave it at that. I'm going to just add one word quickly, is uh, immigration and demo demographics is a big part of it, which is not properly economic process, but is the different societies, not only Americans, but others, non-Western societies. Resistance to globalization has a heavy uh, demographic component to it, too. Yeah. So what we'll do, let's take a question from both sides, because sometimes the answers uh, somewhat weave together. Um, so we'll, we'll get your question, 
And then uh, First Sergeant Walker, we'll get yours, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer both uh, simultaneously. So my question is centered around both today and yesterday. So yesterday we heard talk about maybe letting the Middle East decide its own economic policies and let it decide its own fate in terms of its little hemisphere that it has. And I can't help but think about the Monroe Doctrine that we had in the early development of our country. So one big question that I had in order to spur the Middle East development, would it be more prudent in Western strategy to sort of implement a quasi Monroe Doctrine in the Middle East, primarily not centered around making sure American or Western influence is in the Middle East, but making sure that the Middle East maintains its own little sphere of cultural influence and its own sphere of self-determination. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, so this question is actually kind of pointed towards you, General McCullough. I just finished a book called Wolves of Hudman Province about your unit in Afghanistan. And something that I found really interesting is um, a lot of your Marines were issued money right off the bat getting there that they were kind of uh, instructed to use towards the infrastructure in the area um, to kind of prop that up. My question is um, kind of bouncing off of that, what he was going after, you know, do you see that working on a larger scale? Um, I see it as kind of like a, a money pit. Like, do we throw money at the Middle East? Um, or is it better to just stick away? But I, I think there's another thing that's been brought up a lot at this conference is, do we have a responsibility to help out here? Um, you know, we played a big part in the Middle East in the past few years, and it's been a part of my life since I was born. So, you know, do we have a responsibility to the Middle East to help out? And, and where do we attach that money to? How does that money get there and where it needs to go to actually fix the issue? Questions? I can, I can take the first one a little bit, maybe the end of, of that one. Um, so I, I would say no, I wouldn't support a, a quasi-Monroe doctrine for the Middle East. I think it, it, the implication is, again, about a framework in which, as outsiders, we would know better than what the, the people who live in the region would, would do. And I, I don't think that's the direction in, in, you know, at this point in the 21st century that, that U.S. foreign policy should be should be going. I think we've seen uh, the cost in the past, not just with the U.S., but many um, empires uh, around uh, in the last few hundred years, the cost of that approach. And um, I, so I don't think that's the, the direction that we'd want to go. I can jump in here. So um, if, if you think about the Monroe Doctrine and think about the economic performance of the, of the region that is, falls under that, it's not been stellar. Um, and basically, uh, empires and, are extractive. They're not constructive. The place where America's influence was by far the best was in uh, Western Europe and in and the Far East, uh, East Asia, where America was building bulwarks against communism. So America was investing in Korea, in Japan, in Taiwan, in uh, Hong Kong, in Singapore, uh, in Southeast Asia, and making those countries wealthy uh, with trade, providing incentives, as uh, Jeremy was saying, as opposed to, to sticks. And East Asia prospered. Western Europe also prospered under American support. The, uh, it was the Marshall Plan uh, that was injecting money and in development and at, as a bulwark against Soviets. So, but in its own backyard, America was extracted. It gave us the term banana republic. Okay, so it's not good to fall under the sphere of, into the sphere of influence of someone uh, it's, uh, North Korea is, is, is the, the worst country in the world, and it's in the sphere of China. But everyone around China is doing very well because they're able to balance against China and have the support of the United States. So think about the principle that you don't want to have uh, to be in, in, in someone's sphere of influence. But America can do good and create allies, wealthy allies, powerful allies, by supporting th their interests when uh, they are, in fact, balancing. And in terms of throwing money, uh, remember that money uh, can be, uh, if, if, if it's distributed, it can lead to all kinds of violence as people scramble forward. So it's throwing money at something 
it, it, you have to be very, very careful about how you do it. And I would urge again, pr uh, pragmatic experimentalism. If investment in a region can actually uh, dampen a conflict, uh, remove a bone of contention, then do it. But try it out, and, and if it works, roll it out. Can I say one thing um, for you, Matthew? Uh, on your last question um, to, uh, to General McCullough, does the United States have a responsibility? My answer to that would be, as I said to someone yesterday, is turn your question into an answer, turn it into a statement. I, I would like to hear what you think, not now, but this fall when you take my class, uh, <laughs> where we're going to be talking about just that's one of the things, this class that I th a few people here have signed up for, the costs of war. We're going to be debating these types of things. And uh, anyone, I've already invited Colonel uh, Dr. Krauss. Uh, anyone's welcome to come join and talk about these things with us. So you've already got your homework. And I do have you captive for another year, so uh, <laughs> we'll have multiple discussions, but uh, someone can guide you through um, th some Thucydides. And uh, when you start looking at people's motivations for taking certain actions through that lens of fear, honor, and interest, and realize not everyone on the world stage has the ability to work in their own interest, and sometimes their motivations are strictly through the fear and honor lens. It'll give you some insights as to how we interact uh, with other places. They have a strategy they're trying to um, enable, as, uh, as do other powers. It happens on the, the margins of where powers meet. And, uh, I've just given you a homework assignment. It's a tough book to get through, but it's worthwhile, and you'll use it for life. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, Dr. Roberts, I'm going to direct this question uh, primarily towards you. So you advocated for a much more soft power approach to the Middle East with education specifically. It, are you advocating for a complete withdrawal of American forces from the Middle East, and if so, how would you suggest we deal with extremist groups that are inevitably going to fill the power vacuum in the Middle East? And also going off of that, to what extent do we have a moral obligation to protect people in the Middle East from groups like these? Good question, and I'm proud of you for asking me a tough question that I'm not really sure how to answer. <laughs> uh, no, I, and I almost feel like I'm a politician running for office and you're asking me like what my position is. I think that <laughs> anyone saying let's withdraw, you know, it would be silly uh, from a policy perspective. But also, I don't think that we necessarily have to differentiate or, or say that soft power means the military is not involved. So there have been instances uh, where the military has done some tremendous um, public good for the world. So, you know, let's say we have, we have two marine officers here. Let's just say there's a, a hurricane in country X. Huge, you know, infrastructure is destroyed, people need first aid, food and water. You know, they, every marine is a rifleman, but I'm pretty darn sure a few thousand marines would do a really good job of getting water to people, starting to parse through the rubble, get infrastructure running again. So the military is not necessarily always used for hard power. Uh, but I do think, I, I, I think it's fair to say that one of the things we've learned in the past four years is the United States has overextended itself. Uh, and and uh, that is something that you, the, the U.S. military can back as a man of saying for the time. Listening to the last five questions, four questions, you see this tension between uh, retreat, not retreat, sorry, isolationism, and um, responsibility uh, that Matthew, was it Matthew, uh, said. Um, so this tension is in the US foreign policy. Um, America first, or as I said. So um, nation building and state building with military forces. Listen, don't forget, I'm going to just give you catchphrases. Time is running. Uh, US national debt is, how much is it, 13? It's a lot. <laughs> there is a nation building to do here. As a foreign observer from Canada, as far as I can grasp. Okay, okay. Pass the ball to you guys. You? Thank you. All right. It looks no. like Yangmo. We should have time for one more. 
Okay. Make them quick, concise. Sure. Awesome. Good morning. Um, so we talked a lot about stability and um, how the U.S. is tied in and the West is tied in with the Middle East. So kind of building off that stability um, and looking at it from the other side of the coin, um, are Russia and China as well interested in stability in the Middle East, or is it in their best interest that the U.S. is tied up and Professor Roberts, as you said, potentially overextended in that region? So this question is open to the panel. Um, with regard, so China has been a topic of the panel over the last few days and their role in the Middle East as well. Um, and it seems that their overall message and vision for the Middle East, their pole of power as it is re-emerging, is in opposition to the American one of spreading this patchwork of liberal democracies that we were pursuing um, in the late 90s and early 2000s in the region. Um, and given that that vision hasn't come to fruition over 20 years of us attempting to do it, does the United States need to pursue a different course, one more of realism like we did with the Soviet Union in the 20th century, or was this a failure of execution and on the ground um, during the early 21st century? All right, so over the past two days, we've seen how complex of a question this is, but to make it concise, yes or no, do you think peace in the Middle East is possible? Do China and Russia want peace in the Middle East? I think one interesting thing, I think yes. That to, but on the other hand, uh, if someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that after 9 11, on the day of September 11th, the first uh, foreign leader that President Bush spoke with was Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin said, hey, I would do anything. This is a huge problem uh, for all of us, right? Uh, I'll do what I can to support. Now, things changed, but I can assure you that when the United States was mired in a, in a two-front war occupying Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Putin and uh, the Russians and the Chinese were pretty well happy to sit and watch that happen uh, because it was, you know, it deeply hurt the United States. Um, so, but yes, I would say Peace in the Middle East is probably possible, but it's likely. I agree very much with Professor Mukhtari, who spoke last night. That we're seeing uh, this last, you know, post World War II, all of this stuff that has been happening. If you look at the long arc of Middle Eastern history, is a, a blip on the radar. I, I think. Please. So um, I would say, first of all, there's a halfway house between uh, withdrawing your military from the Middle East and um, and. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and enhancing stability, S stop shooting, okay? Be there, but don't shoot, and just try and tamp down. Second thing I would, uh, I would pick up on the point about Professor Bokhtari's comment yesterday, which was, actually I think it was at the, uh, at the dinner, uh, so for, for the benefit of everyone here, he was talking about the possibility of uh, kind of U European Union style confederation in, um, in, in the Islamic world in Central Asia. Uh, and if you now think about the, um, the dynamics of U.S. involvement in the world in the post-war period, where its greatest successes were in East Asia, where it promoted uh, uh, strong economies uh, surrounding China, and in Western Europe, where it promoted and accommodated the European Union, uh, uh, trying to promote such a concept in the Middle East might actually be ideal. Um, just to give you a sense of, of the uh, U.S. involvement in, in Europe, when the Europeans wanted their common market, their, com uh, their common agricultural policy, this was not in the U.S. interest, direct interest. It was in the interest of building Europe, and the United States accommodated so that's the kind of, of long-term thinking, taking short-term movements to try and promote some kind of integration, economic development. The European Union started out as this, a coal and steel community. You can build something up in the Middle East that would resemble that, that would be brilliant. Um, <coughs> 
Maybe we'd agree. I don't know that, that peace in the Middle East is a very broad term. So when I, when I think about that, let me focus in on a couple of things. I tend to think about Israel-Palestine because that's what I do a lot of my research on. But let me just set that aside and say, you know, I think of three civil wars going on in the Middle East right now, in Libya, in, in Syria, and in Yemen. And so I think if the question is, will those civil wars end, they will end. Civil wars don't generally last forever. Um, and and, and one, one thing I hope we can pay attention to in developing uh, Saudi-Iranian relations is the extent to which that has a positive effect for the civilians of Yemen, right? The people who've been in a, in, a, in a pretty brutal humanitarian situation for a number of years now. So do I think that, that peace in the Middle East can happen? Yeah, and, and I'm thinking in particular about those, about those civil wars. Um, in terms of the United States uh, spreading, attempting to spread liberal democracy in the in the region, um, I, I have to say I think you know maybe maybe taking issue a little bit with the question, just you know in a friendly way, uh, that the U.S. has mixed motivations, and sometimes the United States is uh, pushing democracy and human rights, and otherwise other times when it seems like that will conflict with pro-U.S. interests, uh, the United States is is much less willing slash unwilling uh, to do so, and we've seen that repeatedly, for instance, with the U.S. Saudi. Uh, relationship, but bear in mind, the United States itself is wrestling with democracy, and so there's a certain assumption. I think we, when we ask that question, sometimes like we know what we're doing, and we're going to teach other people that. Maybe we need to figure out what we're doing, right? And and I say that with some humility about the, the struggles that our country uh, country faces right now. Um, and I'll I'll leave Russia and China to others who are just the last word on the. Um uh, maybe it's a good exercise for you guys as a students is uh, also for scholars is um, the uh, fragmented thinking about Middle East peace and conflict. Uh, when you think about the conflict in Yemen or Libya, um, Syria, you got to think also how it is connected to Iranian proliferation, right, to extremism. Uh, to U.S. action in Syria or Russian deployment in, in that country and Chinese incursion. As long as you think in a fragmented way about the issues of Middle East, you want to go far. I understand there is a pragmatic side to it. You want to focus on problems one by one. You don't want to search for Magic Johnson solution. Uh, however, in terms of analysis, you need to have, as a student of Middle East, a, um, a framework to connect Syria to Libya to Yemen to Iran, Israeli situation, and all that. For example, I finish on this. You cannot ask Iranians, be it monarchy or mullahs now, not to have ballistic missiles and nuclear weapon and allow and tolerate a nuclear Pakistan and nuclear Israel or whoever else comes up. It's just not possible. Okay? So you got to just get them connected all those issues together. Yeah. I would just uh, point out two items Earlier, you heard us talking about uh, the drive towards stability and uh, military planner in the room. Um, both peace and war are not permanent states. Um, I think that drives us at times to have goals of stability, holding off war for as long as possible, uh, because once, once war is let off the leash, you don't always know the results that you're going to have. Uh, the passions of the people become inflamed, and uh, stability seems to be more in line with uh, many of our goals to hold off the, the leash coming off for as long as possible. When it comes to what, uh, what some of our adversaries do there in the Middle East, I'll, I'll go back to what I told Matt about looking at things through those lenses of fear and honor and interest. When we see our adversaries doing things there, uh, just because they're doing them does not always mean that it's in our worst interest to have the results that they may achieve. At times, uh, even your adversary's goals may align with your interests, and it requires, I think, a, a clear eye and a clear analysis. Uh, if they are willing to undertake the, the work that is required and it achieves something that achieves perhaps the stability that we uh, would hope for, 
hold off war as long as possible. If someone else does it, maybe that's better for us. It's worth entertaining, and policymakers should look through that lens before uh, condemning actions that we may have taken on our own had someone else not done them. That can help you, uh, help you analyze those things. And I think we're out of time. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> so the last two uh, days, through a series of presentations and discussions, we had a great opportunity to broaden and deepen our understanding of the Middle Eastern region and the dynamic global community. Distinguished uh, speakers and guests, thank you so much for uh, your participation in this year's summit. Um, I think I have uh, some comments to do, but especially uh, just the, right now, some scholars and people, they talk about the possibility of the rise of outbreak of World War III, uh, so witnessing the Russian uh, just the uh, expansion of war and just the North Korean the nuclear and missile kind of tensions and U.S.-China strategic rivalry uh, it's, uh, has been intensifying. Uh, so that I think even just the, uh, during this summit, uh, we just learned a lot of kind of uh, complex problems in Middle Eastern regions. So I think definitely uh, just the, the current leaders, uh, national leaders and international leaders, they have to be really cautious and make every effort to prevent the rise of these kind of military conflicts. Also uh, try to promote peace and stability uh, in this world because uh, billions of people's uh, lives are contingent, contingent upon uh, their strategic decisions. But future leaders, right? I think it's uh, really important for uh, you guys uh, to deepen and broaden your perspective and knowledge over all these kind of international kind of conflicts and problems and issues, entangled uh, problems, uh, so that just uh, uh, the, the witnessing and facing this challenging world, but because of you guys, uh, the, when you guys become the leaders of uh, this nation and this community, uh, in the national community, with uh, deep knowledge and just a humble character and just the strategic kind of uh, insights and all those things, just that we can make this water, uh, this world a better place to live in. So uh, anyway, thank you so much uh, for your participation again. And at this point, we end Norwich's 2023 Middle East Summit. Um, just I hope uh, you have a nice day and just to see you at the future summit. Thank you again.